Next talk is going to be by Mike Zessman. So let's give him a big hand, please. All right, thank you very much. So yeah, this talk is about, um, what's it called? Oh yeah, criminal charges not pursued hacking PKI. So there's been a lot of talk about SSL in the media recently and pretty much ever since last summer when, uh, when Dan put out his big DNS flaw and all of a sudden it was very easy to become man in the middle for uh, you know, a, lot of, uh, a large portion of the, of the internet, uh, if not even just a, a local network. So what this talk is going to be about, it's about the, uh, the web application flaws of certificate authority websites. So certificate authority websites like your VeriSigns and your thoughts, I mean that's where you go. When you need SSL for your site, you have to go to one of these sites and it's their job to make sure that you're who you say you are and that you're authorized to get a certificate for the domain that you're requesting for. Uh, obviously we can't have people going around claiming to be PayPal and saying, yeah, give me a cert that all major browsers will, will trust as me being PayPal. So that's what we're going to talk about. Now, now why, do we need, why do I feel like we need to have this talk? Well, I think CAs need to be held accountable uh, for their lack of security as we've seen over the last year since a lot of people have actually started uh, uh, looking at SSL as a target. Because um, the main problem is when CAs are successfully attacked, if you own a CA or you somehow game a CA's validation mechanism, the CA doesn't really hurt because in fact they might even make money off the deal because you're just buying a certificate from them. But the people who are going to suffer are users of the internet, the people who trust that CA. And unfortunately, nowadays, we don't really make those trust decisions on our own. Uh, we kind of just use a browser and for the most part, most people uh, will just end up trusting whoever the browser trusts. So what I hope you guys take away from this presentation, uh, we're going to talk about um, SSL rebinding, which is a new technique. I don't know how many people were here, were, were at Black Hat. I don't know. Raise your hands. I know there were a couple. How many of you came and saw my talk? All right. How many saw my demos fail epically? Okay. So we're going to go over SSL rebinding, which is uh, a technique that we use to bypass extended validation SSL, which is the next generation of SSL. But I think uh, uh, the technique can be used for, uh, you know, many more applications than just EV. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, really, I think this talk is focusing on general web application security awareness. So if you're either a web app pen tester or maybe you're in charge of some, some web applications or websites, uh, hopefully you'll, you'll take away some, of, uh, some valuable information from this based on how these CAs are failing to secure their own web apps. Uh, I, I think most importantly, uh, what people should take away from this talk is a higher scrutiny approach to SSL PKI. Um, you know, maybe we really shouldn't be just trusting whoever our browser trusts. Maybe we need to look in that certificate authority store and see that we're actually trusting uh, certificate authorities from all over the world, not just VeriSign and the ones we know of, but some random uh, certificate authority in Hong Kong or wherever it may be. So a little bit about the title of this talk, uh, Criminal Charges Not uh, Pursued. So uh, last December, and the way I've been doing this kind of research, it's been on the side and my wife hasn't been too happy about that. But, uh, you know, I've been looking at random certificate authorities and seeing how they actually uh, process certificate signing requests. And I stumbled upon the Startcom site and I, and I found a, a pretty critical vulnerability uh, in their validation mechanism uh, that we're going to, that we're going to cover in detail and uh, coming up in a couple of slides. But w one of the things they did is, uh, after the event, or the critical event, uh, they published a, a report based on everything uh, that they saw from their perspective, in which they referred to me as the attacker, which was something I'd never really been referred to uh, in the third person before. But, uh, and uh, they also pointed out that they were not pursuing criminal charges, which uh, made me very happy. But uh, I, I do want to say thank you to Startcom because they, uh, they're actually on top of their game and they fix this bug very quickly. So I mean, it just says that these guys care about PKI first and not the money, which I, I think is something we need to really think about. It can be very easy to just get on the CAs really hard because, well, essentially they do have a license to print money. But uh, there, there are some people out there who, who do value the trust. So 
just to kind of go over the background a little bit, why SSL in the first place? Well, like I said, last summer, uh, Dan Kaminsky came out with his ubiquitous DNS flaw, affected everybody. All of a sudden, you can very easily become man in the middle for arbitrary domains. So obviously, if you control DNS in any fashion, whether it be through some sort of DNS exploit or uh, running a, a rogue wireless access point or compromising somebody's DNS server, it can happen any number of ways, you become man in the middle. And there was a discussion on uh, the Daily Dave mailing list, which I, I think uh, Halvar Flaki said, uh, well, this is why SSL was invented. SSL is put in place to ensure end-to-end -end trust, so that I know that my data going out on the wire is encrypted, and I have a good assurance that I know who I'm actually talking to. But DNS is just one thing. I mean, we still have ARP spoofing, insecure wireless networks, uh, and all that. So I, I think SSL is a target regardless of whether or not you can man in the middle half the internet. If your target is one guy who happens to use a, a, you know, an insecure wireless network at the neighborhood cafe every day, uh, these techniques are still going to be of value to you. So a little bit more about SSL PKI in general. Uh, last summer when I started looking at this, again, it was, uh, I was doing the talk on SSL VPNs at Black Hat, so SSL was kind of a you know, big part of that. Uh, Kaminsky came out with his vulnerability and I said, well, how hard is it to get an SSL certificate for a domain that you don't control? And it turned out to, uh, be, to, turned out to not be very difficult. Uh, I had one within a, you know, a couple of hours. Uh, but moving forward from that, I started looking at SSL in general, SSL PKI, and you start to see that there's a really big attack surface involved in this technology. It's not just SSL clients and SSL servers, but it's uh, the certificate authorities themselves, it's the crypto APIs that we use to generate our, our, uh, our key pairs, um, it's the browser, it's the SSL VPN client and the indicators it shows to a user. Uh, all, of the, all these things are, are subject to attack. And it actually uh, branches out very quickly. Uh, you know, I haven't touched this one in a while, but already I, I know there's one, uh, one certificate authority threat in the middle. It's kind of hard to see, but it's uh, the weaponized CSR, certificate signing request, which if anyone sat through Moxie's talk this morning, uh, that's essentially what he had, uh, a crafted CSR that will end up uh, causing a certificate authority to give him a cert that's pretty much valid for any domain name. So the SSL threat model, I think, is, uh, I, I like it. I'm going to put this out on the internet, uh, up on my blog. I think it's going to change over time. But uh, I think it's pretty cool that you can pick any one of these nodes on this tree and say, all right, well, I'm going to go after that. And unfortunately for everyone, it seems like a lot of these uh, attacks and, and threats can actually be realized. So a little bit more about the uh, SSL track record. So I said before, one, one of the uh, core goals of SSL is actually to protect uh, protect data in transit. So we know when we put our bytes out on the wire uh, and they're traversing untrusted networks over the internet, that random people can't just, well, sniff our packets and see what we're talking about. And that works pretty well. Uh, implementation specific bugs aside, like we had the uh, Debian pseudo random number generator bug where a large number of keys turned out to be very weak and we had some crypto attacks. But aside from that, uh, for now, this is working well. Uh, one thing to note about this is encryption is free. Uh, you know, anyone with a crypto API can generate a key pair uh, and start, uh, you know, communicating using SSL. But then we also have site validation, which is another uh, key component of SSL PKI. That's where we start talking about trust. And this is why when you get a cert uh, when you go to a certificate authority, uh, you have to pay them a little bit. This is their business. Uh, you give them a CSR, you pay them some money. They try to validate that you're uh, authorized for the domain you're requesting a cert for, uh, and then they give you the cert that's trusted by all the browsers. But when we talk about site validation, well, what does that mean? That means that when you're going to a website, uh, you have a, a good degree of assurance that you know who you're talking to. If you're trying to talk to uh, bankofamerica.com, SSL is supposed to let you know that you're really talking to the real Bank of America web server, not bank America or bank-of-america.com or, you know, other sort of uh, uh, variations on the name. But what we see is that well over a decade, you know, I think uh, VeriSign actually came out with a uh, press release last week saying in 14 years they've done uh, or they've sold 4 million SSL certificates, and that's just VeriSign. 
but well over a decade of profits has not yielded uh, adequate fishing prevention. I mean, we're still dealing with phishing attacks in spite of SSL. Uh, and, and as Moxie has shown us, now we have uh, things like null byte injection attacks in our certificate signing requests that offers a whole new attack vector uh, allowing attackers to kind of exploit this trust. Uh, one of the things though to combat phishing uh, that certificate authorities and well, web browser vendors have come up with is called EVSSL or Extended Validation SSL. Um, they kind of work together in an organization called the CAB, uh, the CAB Forum, which is a certificate authority slash browser forum. And it's like a nonprofit like industry group where the browser vendors and the CAs work together to uh, try and make progress. What they, what they came up with, uh, and it's been out for a couple of years, it's not widely deployed, but there are sites out there using it. I use Bank of America, they use EV. Um, are these EV certs. And essentially what EV is compared to regular SSL, which we've had for, you know, 14 years now at least, um, is that the, to get an EV cert requires rigorous offline validation process. This means you're showing your articles of incorporation, uh, you're getting documents notarized. Uh, essentially it's not an automated process. It's not fill out a form on a web app, click a link, and uh, get a, a trusted certificate, which is exactly what we have with DV or domain validated SSL, which I'll just refer to as regular SSL from now on because it's easier to say. But essentially, so what's the difference between an EV SSL certificate and a regular SSL certificate? Well, in this screenshot, you see that we have this, or we're connecting to paypal.com and we have this green badge right next to the address bar. When we click on that green badge, we actually see identity information about the legal identity of the organization running www.paypal.com for that connection. And that's what we're gonna talk about uh, in another slide. But essentially, the, the idea behind EVSSL is to give uh, your typical end user a very easy method of quickly recognizing what site they're connected to and then making a trust decision based on that identification. Now, what a lot of people are saying now uh, in light of you know, some of the research that I did with Alex Sodorov and that people have done before us like uh, Colin Jackson and Adam Barth is that EV is only supposed to prevent phishing attacks. It's not supposed to prevent man in the middle attacks. But like I said in the previous slide, there are two things that SSL in general is supposed to do. Number one, protect our bytes on the wire, make sure it's encrypted. And number two, uh, site validation. Give us some idea of who we're actually talking to so that we can, we can trust them. And uh, you know, I think the, the idea that uh, EV SSL is only supposed to now all of a sudden fix one of those problems, the site validation, and not protect against man in the middle attacks is flawed and uh, a number of steps backwards. Uh, well, just another uh, couple of technical notes about EV versus regular SSL is that you could install your own certificate authority cert in, inside a browser, inside a certificate trust store, and all of a sudden any uh, regular SSL certs that you uh, create and sign will be trusted by the browser, meaning you're not going to get warnings and pop-ups all over the place. With EV, that's a lot different. Uh, the EV root certificate authorities are actually hard-coded uh, in the web browser. So you're not gonna be able to get your own EV root into IE. You will be able to get your own EV root into Firefox if you jump through a lot of hoops and uh, write a lot of code and compile your own version. So EV is kind of the, the next generation of SSL, but we still have DV, or, or regular SSL, and we still trust both of them. So what I'm kind of focusing on right now, because the, the EV certs, you have to, like I said, jump through all these offline hoops. You have to talk to people on the phone and fill out paperwork, talk to lawyers, all this nonsense <laughs> from my perspective. But getting a DV certificate is still rather easy. It's still, for a lot of uh, certificate authorities, an automated process. So just to kind of step through that, I don't know, maybe a show of hands, who here has ever purchased an SSL certificate from a, okay, maybe about less than half. Uh, a more detailed question, how many times have you done that in a year, more than once? Well, all right, the numbers go down. So it's not a process that we do regularly. 
So that's why I think it's, it's good to kind of step through uh, the process of getting a DV cert. So the first thing you're going to do is use your crypto API. Uh, I use OpenSSL. Uh, you generate a private key and then you generate a uh, certificate signing request or a CSR. Uh, the CSR contains the public key, the other half of the, uh, of the key pair. You then go to a certificate authority. Oh, and one other thing, when you're creating that CSR, that's when you tell it what the CN common name or the domain name that you're looking to secure is. So if, uh, you're, if your uh, website is www.bank.com, you uh, create the CSR with the CN, the CN of www.bank.com. Then you go fill out the CA order form with your billing information, enter your credit card, paste the CSR in, uh, hit submit, they start processing your order. With domain validated SSL or regular SSL, the way they determine that you're really authorized uh, for that domain, www.bank.com, is they'll send an email containing a secret, a password of sorts, to uh, a specific email alias at bank.com. Now you as a person who's actually placing the order, typically you have a choice. You can say which alias uh, you want that email sent to. And obviously if, if it's legitimate, uh, it would be an alias that you have control over. You can go check that mailbox, get that secret, click on a link, return the secret, and thereby you show the CA that you really are authorized for that domain because you have control over this particular email alias. At that point, once you confirm to the CA that you have the secret, you are who you say you are, they issue the certificate. Now, I don't know about you, but email isn't really all that secure. So there, <laughs> there are a number of, uh, of methods of you know, intercepting email, sniffing bytes on the wire. Obviously, this stuff is going out plain text. There's no encryption involved. So really, anyone kind of downstream of the certificate authority's SMTP server could possibly get that secret and theoretically uh, get that, or, you know, get an SSL certificate for a domain which they're not authorized for. Another important thing to note is that it's pretty easy to game these certificate authorities. They're not really going to be able to tell, in fact, who you actually are. So uh, I'm going to talk about how I got some certificates for domains I don't control at the end of this presentation, but I did that using a completely fake alias and a cash credit card here, a Visa gift card that I bought at CVS. And this was the first time I actually ever kind of went down that route of, you know, coming up with my own alias and really trying to do, uh, you know, uh, not reveal my own identity. And the one fatal flaw in my plan is that when I picked up the cash credit card, I didn't check the expiration date on it, and I actually bought one that was expired. So the, the right side screenshot is when I went back, because I paid 100 bucks for this thing, and now I can't use it for anything. Uh, and apparently, nobody ever does that, so nobody knew how to actually exchange this credit card. And in, in the end, they wanted my real driver's license, too, which you see blurred out there on the CVS counter. So. That was epic fail number one for the month of July for me. But um, just remember, check the expiration date. And once you get your cash credit card with your assumed identity, you can pretty much go to a CA and get a non-attributable SSL certificate. Where's the expiration date on a cash card? Uh, on the back, uh, the question was, where is the expiration date on the cash card? Uh, you can actually view it. It's in small print uh, near the barcode. I, it's there. You just got to know to look for it. Some of them are stamped, okay. All right, so with that, we're gonna go into uh, a demonstration, a live internet demo that failed horribly at Black Hat, but will not fail now, um, of SSL rebinding. And what this attack shows is that if you get a DV SSL certificate or a regular SSL certificate, which is subject to all sorts of technical attacks on certificate authority websites, you can uh, reach a quality with an EV cert, one of these certs that's really hard to get, and get that green badge or that green glow in the address bar uh, that users uh, love and trust so much. So with that, all right, my resolution got a little out of whack, but we can figure So here in my XP workstation, this is our, our victim. And right here in this shell, this symbolizes, or this is actually the, uh, the man in the middle. 
So the VM is uh, connecting through my host OS, and I'm using uh, IP firewall rules on uh, OSX to reroute traffic. So we'll start our proxy here. All right, the proxy is running, starting evil PayPal SSL proxy. And I'll type in HTTPS. Okay, we see SSL rebinding a new connection. And now we see in the main window here that we see PayPal, we see this green glow. If I click on it, it says it's run by PayPal Inc. All right, so now we'll actually log in. And two things you need to look at here. Number one, I want you to look at the green bar. It's kind of hard to follow both things. But then we'll also see some really interesting information show up in the shell coming through the proxy. Now remember, the green glow means that you're connected to uh, PayPal. That, that's what it's supposed to mean. This is an SSL connection uh, that no one in the middle of the web browser, in between the web browser and the web server, should be able to look at your data. We'll click login. And we see my username and my mask password show up in the shell. And then right now, if you look at it, the green glow went away and then it came back. So now we're, we're still logging in. We see some more information over in the shell now. We see that how much money is in my PayPal account, even though we have the green glow. So what we've done, what SSL rebinding actually is, is it's a, an active man in the middle proxy that's saying, okay, for this TCP connection where you're requesting the login page, I'm gonna let you terminate SSL with the real web server and the EV SSL certificate, and thereby showing the green glow in the web browser. User thinks everything is fine. They see the green glow. This is new super duper SSL. There's no way I'm gonna get it, I'm gonna get it hacked. But then on the next connection, which actually happens when I enter my username and password and press login, that causes the browser to send a post request. We create a new TCP connection that goes through the man in the middle again. This time the man in the middle says, okay, don't terminate SSL with them, terminate SSL with me. Here's my DV or my regular SSL certificate that's trusted by your web browser, which was very easy for me to get by hacking a CA website. The browser says, okay, that's fine with me. Terminates SSL, sends the bytes over the wire right through the man in the middle who captures all your data in plain text. Uh, that goes through to the, uh, or the man in the middle actually captures that data at this point, and instead of actually proxying it to the real web server, he's, he keeps it and sends a redirect request down to the client, causing the client to send that request again. And this time when the client sends a request, the man in the middle says, okay, terminate with the real SSL server, with the real web server, EVSSL, and bang, the green glow comes right back with no prompt to the user. The only way a user would know that anything is going on is if they see that the green, bar, the green glow goes away, but that could just be normal behavior to begin with. So that's an SSL rebinding attack. And that was the SSL rebinding attack that failed horribly at Black Hat, so glad it worked out this time. All right. So move along at 25 minutes left, it looks like. So one thing we need to know about SSL rebinding is that we need to man in the middle every other connection. Typically when you're man in the middling anything, you think, oh, I wanna get everything. But really in a, a, a web browser session or web application session, you're only gonna need either the username or password or maybe post authentication actually capture the user's session cookie. So what would happen if we tried to man in the middle every TCP connection and terminate with SSL and then redirect the browser is we'd get stuck in a loop and the user would never see the green glow. So we came up with a very simple solution for this and that's simply to count each connection coming out of the client and alternate. You're not, you're not guaranteed to get every request, but if you miss the username and password, well then you're gonna get the authenticated session cookie later on. So it works very well. You know, in, in reality, you only need to capture one HTTP connection. Uh, the only other, the other interesting thing uh, that I think was kind of novel about 
about this attack is that you don't need to use 302s all the time because sometimes you need to intercept a post request and you need to get the browser to resend the post data. So you can do that two ways. You can use a, a 200 response, send down an HTML page with some JavaScript that redirects the browser uh, with a, a fabricated form using all the data that was captured by the man in the middle. Or you can send down a 307, which is a variation of a 302, which tells the browser to replay the post and send the post data. There were some interesting things there. Um, Firefox would obey the request, but it would prompt the user and say, hey, this website wants us to replay. Should we, you know, press OK or press no? IE would do the same thing, but without the prompt. IE would replay the request. Uh, this is IE 7 I, I'm talking about. The interesting thing, though, is if the URL, the original URL that the browser posts to, uh, and the redirect URL are the same, there's a bug in IE that wouldn't send the post request data. So you need to kind of fudge the URL on the request, make it look different to the browser. And you can do that very easily by just putting a hashtag on the end, and it worked. And with that, there's no JavaScript required. So that was kind of uh, one of the things we wanted to accomplish. So that's SSL rebinding. That's what you do, or one of the things you can do when you get uh, a regular SSL cert illegitimately, or however you get it. You can use it to spoof an EV SSL session. So now, okay, how do, how do we get these regular SSL certs? Well, CAs use web applications. Has anybody here heard of OWASP, the Open Web Application Security Project? Well, there's a whole big industry and a lot of money going into web application security. And unfortunately, it doesn't look like certificate authorities spend a lot of their money on web application security, <laughs> which is kind of funny when you think that maybe everybody here who's purchasing SSL certificates for their websites that they're trying to secure is relying on a company that might or might not actually care about the same thing. So here on this screen we see a screenshot of uh, obviously an EVSSL protected session with Komodo CA with cross-site scripting on it. I call that EVXSS, Extended Validation XSS. This way, you know exactly which site is getting XSS'd. This is another screenshot from some other kind of random small uh, mom and pop CA, trustlogo.com, where you can validate other people's SSL certificates, and they themselves have uh, a security pop-up because they're using SSL improperly. Trustlogo.com. Uh, Let's see, here's another one, same site, uh, some kind of verbose Oracle SQL error message, possibly some SQL injection going, going on there in, in a post request. Uh, some more EVSSL protected uh, CA shenanigans. Here we have a, uh, a default service exposed. Uh, it's the Axis web service something or other. I think it's from Apache. Uh, same website, here's their, uh, their WSDL. Uh, XSS.com, uh, here's about, I don't know, six different VeriSign URLs uh, reported to XSS with XSS in them, most likely also protected via EVSSL, latest and greatest. Uh, here's a small uh, CA that nobody's probably ever heard of. Uh, they're actually based out of Spain somewhere, and uh, they have a whole bunch of uh, input validation flaws going on in their web application. And again, this is a web application where you uh, request certificates and are supposed to go through their rigorous domain validation process. A little more EVX, EVXSS, this time on Thought. They're a pretty big name. So the question was, are these trusted root certificate authorities, are they trusted by all the major web browsers? And the answer is yes. This is an interesting one. It doesn't look like much, but last summer when I was poking around trying to get my very first illegitimate SSL certificate, basically the website I was looking at failed open. Um, it was kind of, I guess, to put it simply, the web application said, well, I don't really know who you are, so I'm going to show you everybody else's data, and you pick the data that you want. <laughs> so I, I've done my best to, uh, to mask somebody's tax ID number there. But that was a major certificate authority as well, somebody who should know better. 
Now, last summer, the certificate that I did end up getting was a certificate for uh, login.live.com, which if anybody knows about Microsoft service offerings, uh, Hotmail, Passport, uh, login.live.com is the main authentication portal. That's where you post your credentials to. What I didn't know at the time, though, I got this regular SSL cert. They actually used uh, an EV SSL cert. So last summer, I could have been doing this talk, but, well, who knew? <laughs> So, you know, we see now that certificate authorities, they're, they're not doing everything they need to be doing. But then still, well, why would somebody want to hack a certificate authority? Well, number one, they're just like any other e-commerce website. Uh, they're storing personal and business information. They've got credit card numbers. Uh, but personally for me, you know, I'm not out to do this for any, uh, you know, malicious purposes, but it's kind of funny that they have one purpose, and that's to make sure that they give certificates out to the people who are, who are authorized to have them, and they just seem to be failing at that. So I say for the lulls, too, because it's pretty funny when you get one. But uh, to come at it from a more technical point of view, we want to take advantage of the trusted private keys. The trusted private keys that the CAs hold are what can sign a certificate to make it trusted by all these common web browsers, be it IE or Firefox, as well as other things like code signing certificates or, or personal email certificates. Uh, a little bit about the certificate authority security measures in, in the domain validation process. Um, some of the things they look at are domain registration records. Uh, some of them have actually have phone authentication uh, validation processes, which I haven't really explored. But mostly they focus on this email to this predefined list of authorized email addresses and the use of secret tokens. So they send an email to the, to the email address specified and they send the secret. Uh, now, what these tokens look like actually varies from CA to CA. So the first one we see from Thought looks a lot like an MD5 hash. Uh, I've tried to guess what's in it. I haven't been able to. The second one is from GeoTrust. I believe they're owned by VeriSign. Uh, below that is the Komodo uh, authentication token. And then each CA has their own URL where this, uh, this token or secret needs to be passed into. And that's where they say, well, we don't know what this token is. You can't do anything. Or, OK, we know that token. Do you want to approve this SSL certificate and let it get issued? So that's really the key. That's one of the keys there. If you can figure out how a certificate authority generates this secret, you can own that certificate authority and generate as many certs as you want. I haven't been able to do that yet. Maybe one of you can. One other thing I, I found is that some CAs actually have a blacklist, meaning that if you try to get a certificate for like, well, I tried to get one for verisign.com, <laughs> and, and I got flagged. I, you know, I, I got a little greedy there. Um, so there are sites that are on these blacklists, and that's okay. I mean, it's better than nothing, right? That's good for Verisign, good for Bank of America, good for PayPal. But what about, I don't know, dod.mil or dod.gov or whatever random host name it is any, any one of us might be trying to secure. For example, sslvpn.yourcompany.com. Probably not going to be on the blacklist. Now, before we get into the real CA attacks, uh, I just kind of wondered. I don't know. People leak stuff on the internet all the time. So yeah, you can Google for RSA private keys. Um, one, I spent a whole day going through every one in Google. And it, you know, it's kind of cool. It's funny. I only ended up getting one full uh, key pair. You know, I, I found their private key like this, and then I just downloaded their SSL certificate, put it together, and it was for, I, I don't even remember the domain name. You know, if, if Bank of America is going to fall victim to this, we, we got bigger problems to worry about. But still, kind of funny, kind of cool. This past winter, though, you probably heard about the MD5 collision attack, where a number of researchers used 200 PlayStations and some crazy crypto attack to generate their own rogue certificate authority. This kind of trumps anything I'm going to talk about, because I'm talking about getting a cert here, a cert there. These guys were able to build their own cert certificate authority that was just trusted by every major web browser. And they did that by exploiting weaknesses in uh, MD5 uh, hashing algorithm, which has been known to be broken for a while. Uh, so they did this crazy crypto attack using their 200 PlayStations, but the type of crypto attack they did was called a chosen prefix, where they had to get something from a spe specific certificate authority with known data that, they, uh, that they've provided. And the way they did that was through an automated 
script that basically got certificates out of this uh, certificate authority through their web application. So what could have kind of stopped them dead in their tracks or drastically increased the complexity of their attack would have been a hardened web application. The two specific attributes that they needed to be able to predict in the certificate authority were uh, the time of issuing, the exact you know, time in seconds that the certificate was issued, and the serial number. And they were able to do that through this web app. If this web app just added a simple random time delay in the issuing process, I mean milliseconds, seconds, nothing much, it would have drastically increased the complexity of this attack. Similarly, if they used non-predictable serial numbers, uh, that would have happened. So essentially here, yeah, we've got a broken crypto algorithm and this crazy crypto attack, but if the web application was, defined, was designed with a defense in depth attitude, uh, maybe this attack wouldn't have happened. Another certificate authority attack that happened last year, uh, a user simply went to a, a reseller of the Komodo certificate authority, asked for a cert for Mozilla.com, and got it. The answer, validation was turned off. Whoops. Uh, when I started looking at some Komodo resellers, what I found was that the reseller itself actually controls the whole authorization process. So while Komodo goes through the web trust audit and jumps through all these hoops and pays a lot of money to actually become trusted by a web browser, they sign up resellers and then just offload the whole uh, process of validating certificate requests on them. So what you see here in this screenshot, uh, I set up a domain to capture uh, the email containing the authorization code and it actually came out of the uh, the, the CA resellers shared hosting environments SMTP server. So what that means is, hey, you own that shared hosting environment, well, you can pretty much generate certificates uh, signed by Komodo at your will. But why try and own the, uh, the shared hosting environment when you can just sign up and be a Komodo reseller with a cash credit card? <laughs> so that's, that's, that's on my list of things to do. Uh, now, now here's the attack that uh, actually kind of spawned the, the title of this talk. There's another certificate authority called Startcom, which I, which I stumbled across. Um, essentially, they, they do it a little bit differently, where they have a validation mechanism that you go through, you become validated for a domain, and then you can request certificates for that domain. So here I am, uh, I'm, requesting a val I'm requesting to be validated for intrepidusgroup.com, which is the company I work for. And then they say, okay, well, we're gonna send the verification email to one of these three email addresses, pick one. Uh, I picked one, but then I met in the middle of my browser session using a local client proxy like Paros, and I changed it from whatever it was to my Gmail account. <laughs> and then I checked my Gmail. <laughs> and then I got the secret. <laughs> And, and then I did it a couple more times, <laughs> as you can see, and then I got greedy. So essentially, you could become validated for PayPal.com, you could become validated for Verisign.com, but then when you went through, hey, give me the certificate, I want it now, that's when you went through their blacklist, and they happened to blacklist Verisign.com. And within a couple minutes, I had an email from the CEO saying, oh, it looks like you figured out how to bypass our validation mechanism. I was like, yeah, you know, I was writing up the disclosure. I didn't have a chance to send it yet. <laughs> I really was. But, but Startcom was really cool. I mean, they fixed, this was December 23rd, two days before Christmas. They fixed it that night, and I validated the fix. And I thought that was really cool. Um, another one, not as leet, but still very effective. This is how I got the login.live.com cert. It was through information leakage. Who exploits information leakage? I mean, come on. So here's the aliases you could pick on their order form. There's like 10 of them, whatever. I couldn't register any of those at login.live.com. But they sent me an email which contained some more. I registered SSL certs at live.com, got it, got the email, got the cert. And I'm out of time, but if anybody has some, any further questions, definitely come up and ping me, uh, reach out to me and I'll tell you all I know. <laughs>